Okay, in these uh, last two lectures of this module, we're going to be discussing four uh, very specific topics uh, related to the issues of deviance in society. Um, these are all going to be related to your last discussion board um, post, so instructions for that will be provided in another video. Um, so we're going to talk about two issues in this lecture, two issues in the next lecture, and then we'll wrap up this module. Um, so again, in relation to where a lot of these things, especially some of the things we just talked about in the last lecture regarding incarceration, uh, many of these things um, had their origins in this uh, thing in our society we've called the war on drugs, okay? This concept of uh, illegal uh, classification of substances as controlled. Um, not to say the classification is illegal, but classifying them as illegal or controlled substances is what I meant to say. Um, an interesting statistic, um, again, a lot of times people believe this is based on harm, like how much harm uh, do drugs do? How likely they are to you know, injure or cause uh, uh, death uh, to people in our society is how we decide what should and shouldn't be controlled. Um, and an interesting statistic, for every 350 hours of horseback riding, which people engage in in our society, uh, there's at least one serious accident. Uh, in other words, something that causes uh, serious or traumatic injury to an individual. For every 350 hours of horseback riding, um, for every 10,000 pills of ecstasy consumed, there's one case of acute harm in our society. So if you compare those two activities, every 10,000 pills of ecstasy, there's somebody gets harmed, and every 350 hours of horseback riding, someone gets harmed. Uh, if we're going to base this concept of what should be controlled in our society and what's not, it certainly looks like we should control horseback riding, right? We should not allow people to engage in it because they're likely to get hurt. Um, and again, that's kind of a facetious statement, uh, but it points to this idea that our rationalization of why we control certain substances or behaviors is not necessarily based on this concept of harm. Again, this concept of the illegality of substances is a social construction. We decide right, what type of substances or behaviors are illegal or Ill, you know, not legal or illegal, right? What kind of things? Um, again, the very famous uh, psychologist Thomas Zaz, S-Z-A-S-Z, -S -Z, is quoted in your text. Um, says the difference between legal and illegal drugs is akin to the difference between water and holy water. Again, a religious reference, uh, which maybe some people might find a little irreverent, but the concept of, you know, what do we, how do we determine what's holy water and water? Uh, chemically, they're exactly the same, H2O, right? What constitutes holy water is the belief that someone puts in the idea of, okay, it's been blessed, it is now... Uh, somehow, you know, uh, endowed with, with divine uh, powers, right? Um, and what Zaz is saying is, you know, substances are substances. They're, they're chemicals. They're, they're things that exist. What makes them legal or illegal or moral or not moral uh, is socially constructed. We decide exactly what that is. Um, again, illegality of certain substances is usually due to what we sometimes call moral offense, right? Do we decide something is right or wrong, which is a value judgment. Um, we can often sometimes say this criminalization of drugs, we can make criticisms on several levels. Uh, one, again, is kind of a, a, the idea of it being hypocritical, that we don't go around saying that all substances which cause harm in our society are illegal, right? Again, we've made this case before. Alcohol and tobacco are things that, uh, you know, cause a lot of harm in our society if we just look at it from a criminal or a medical standpoint, uh, and yet those things are legal and other types aren't. Um, again, if we just talk about the way we incarcerate people for these things, there are many more what we would call non-violent drug offenders who are in prisons or incarcerated than there are people incarcerated for crimes like murder and rape. Okay, So, you know, if we're saying harm to society, we would think that people who are clearly demonstrating harm to other individuals would be incarcerated at a higher rate than people who are perhaps only, you know, putting them in quotation, 
you know, causing harm to themselves. Um, and again, we can also look at the hypocrisy in the way we te treat different classes that the, again, it's just sometimes the, the common argument goes, we treat powder cocaine and crack cocaine in two very different ways in the criminal justice system. And again, because of the idea that who's more likely to be using powder cocaine, which is more expensive, probably upper class or the elite in our society, whereas crack cocaine, very cheaply distributed, is more likely to be used by the lower classes or poor people. So we've got this hypocrisy regarding what we regard as substances and how we treat people who deal with them. We definitely know that uh, the war on drugs is discriminatory. Um, drug dealers of minority groups are 20 to 30 times more likely uh, to be arrested than our white people uh, for using drugs in our society. So again, that's a you know that's not one crazy police precinct or you know a couple of crazy uh, racist officers. This is across the board in the United States and many um, DA offices around the world. District attorneys have looked at this concept of you know recognizing the racism within uh, their drug conviction or drug prosecution policies. Um, it's counterproductive. Uh, another argument against the war on drugs. Uh, it is not serving to actually succeed in controlling or, or reducing the number of substances that are used in our society. Um, again, a lot of uh, economists, including some very surprising individuals, Milton Friedman, who we talked about in this class earlier, very conservative, pro-capitalist uh, economist, has very often come out and said that legalizing drugs is what the society needs to do in order to accomplish things like dropping homicide rates that we definitely see that um, you know uh, the amount of crime engaged in our society is increased by the controlling of substances um, again sometimes people who engage in using substances then go on to engage in other criminal activities because of the illegality of those substances so if you are person who, let's say, recreationally casually uses a drug, but then becomes hooked on it, you may either turn to becoming a dealer yourself or engaging in other types of criminal behavior to make sure that you can continue to gain that substance. Um, again, we talk about the idea of, you know, uh, regulation. You know, when I go to a state's liquor store to buy a bottle of wine or, or, or a uh, bottle of liquor, I'm not concerned that there's illegal or, or dangerous substances that have been used to cut this purity of that, you know, so I'm you know, not worried that, you know, uh, you know, my bottle of Jack Daniels might have fentanyl in it, right? I'm, I'm not concerned because there's a high amount of regulation, right? And there's no reason to do that because it's legal and people can charge whatever they want for it. So I can go and I can pick out a very cheap bottle or I can go get a very expensive bottle. And I know that I'm going to be paying the difference based on quality, right? Um, Whereas, again, if we're talking about illegal or controlled substances, there's no regulation and nobody knows what they're getting. We see now in the opiate crisis, again, I just mentioned fentanyl and other uh, substances that are being used to cut or alter uh, drugs to make them cheaper and therefore more profitable for the people making them, but with no regard for the safety or health or well-being of the people that are going to consume them. And again, we definitely know uh, that, uh, you know, the war on drugs has not in any way reduced uh, the consumption of drugs in our society. As a matter of fact, it continues to increase. Um, and it's also very costly. Uh, conservative estimates are that the war on drug costs us about 50 billion, with a B, uh, dollars a year. That's over $1 trillion in approximately the last 40 years of the war on drugs has kind of quote unquote been uh, official. Um, again, conservative economists, sometimes surprisingly, the most outspoken critics, um, I'll include a, a video in our uh, course shell of Milton Friedman, uh, basically just basically making a statement and the drug wars. Um, and again, the, the statement from the text, uh, which I think is really great, a new strategy should be based on public health and harm reduction. Another issue when we talk about deviance in our society is the ongoing trend in our society for what we call the medicalization of deviance. Again, the social definition is behavior, breaking rules, right? Um, and 
And when we talk about, you know, this idea, the social idea or the social sociological idea is that people break rules because they make the decision to do so again, uh, you know, free will, but also from determinism because of social forces, right? This idea of, you know, if people are backed into a corner where they can't afford to eat, you know, they may engage in crime, um, you know, uh, crime has a relationship or a reaction to poverty or discrimination, you know, these kind of things. So the sociological definition is that deviance, crime, uh, uh, rule breaking is a behavior. However, in our society, uh, psychology and especially psychiatry, and this is sometimes where these disciplines tend to clash, um, has been used as a control mechanism, this idea of, okay, we want to, you know, control mechanisms are those things in place in a society to try to stop or address deviance. Um, in, again, uh, Thomas Zaz, the very famous psychologist, um, talks about the difference between medicine and psychiatry. In medicine, new diseases are cured. In psychiatry, they are invented. Kind of this concept, and you, know, you look at even something like the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, the book by which psychologists and psychiatrists uh, diagnose mental illness, has increasingly grown over the years, and not because they're using bigger print or font or, you know, increasing. It's because, again, that idea of continuously introducing new behaviors as diagnosable conditions. And when we think about psychiatry in particular, how are these things addressed? With medication as things to be cured, right? Um, again, in the 1960s, uh, you know, we saw, again, this idea of children with behavioral problems being prescribed Ritalin, which is, again, a, a a uh, stimulant very similar to cocaine. This idea of, okay, if a child will not sit still, we're going to give them medication to deal with that issue. Again, there's a video uh, that talks about this uh, in preparation for our discussion board. Um, again, it's morphed into this idea of ADD or ADHD, which now a preponderance of children in our society have fallen under this diagnosable condition of what we sometimes in earlier parts of the century just called, you know, being a kid, right? Um, again, we definitely saw a lot more people in our society being diagnosed with things like depression. Again, it's not to say sociology in, in particular don't believe in things like mental health issues, but when we start describing from a sociological standpoint more and more and more behaviors, especially behaviors which are considered rule breaking as medical conditions that need to be prescribed and treated with medication, that's what we refer to when we talk about this idea of the medicalization of deviance. Um, and again, so you know, stating, restating the point I just made, do sociologists believe in mental health issues? Yes, however, no studies or tests exist that accurately predict the chemical imbalances that sometimes psychiatrists point to in this and the treatments which are then prescribed to deal with them. Um, again, we sometimes talk about this idea of when we medicalize deviance as this idea of marginalizing or otherizing people, right? So suddenly you've got a diagnosable condition. You're not quote unquote normal, right? As opposed to being a person who makes a decision to, be, uh, to uh, engage in behavior. Um, uh, again, kind of this idea of, you know, how do we treat this? Uh, many, many people are looking at this concept of treating deviance again as a learned behavior. That idea of a person learns to do a behavior, they can unlearn it. Whereas if you're diagnosed with something, it can only be treated with medication. Um, so again, there's that issue. Uh, next lecture, we'll talk about the last two issues.